This is a talk on motor neuron disorders that I gave at multiple PM&R residency programs and also to the Kessler Board Review course. All of it is evidence-based as I am not personally an expert on the topic in my own practice. I mostly read about them and contribute to the electrodiagnostic or clinical diagnosis of motor neuron diseases. I don't run an ALS clinic or inpatient unit. This talk is broken up into sections. The first section talks in general about them and then deeply discusses electrodiagnostic findings. The second section is a laundry list of the various disorders. And the final section is a discussion about management. This is me. I'm an attending physician, no longer at the VA, clinical professor at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. Uh, and I can be found at uh, New Jersey Pain Consultants in Morristown, also known as Altair Health. Uh, I am still involved with the AANEM. Motor neuron diseases are the selective disease damage or destruction of motor neurons in the body. They can be focal or diffuse. Many may begin focally in one region and then progress to a more diffuse presentation. The rule is that they typically will not also involve sensory or autonomic nervous systems. The big exception on the boards is Kennedy disease, which has sensory involvement. We'll also discuss motor neuron diseases that occur as part of uh, multi-system disease, where other systems are definitively involved. Regionally, there are upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons. The upper motor neurons sit in the brain and spinal cord, and they project in tracts that, uh, quite honestly, I've forgotten. They do cross over at some point, as you can see here, to meet with lower motor neurons, which sit in the spinal cord. The alpha motor neurons are the ones sitting in the anterior horn, which we typically care about. I just want to point out that there are these uh, gamma and beta neurons here, gamma and beta motor neurons, which go to something called the spindle. This is a complete digression, but I love teaching it. You'll hear a lot about the spindle if you talk to osteopaths or deal with spasticity. It's an encapsulated organ that lies uh, parallel with the rest of the muscle uh, belly that sends information about the length of the muscle back to the central nervous system. Fibers within the spindle are called intrafusal. Anything outside it, the skeletal muscle you usually think about, is called extrafusal. So there are afferents sending signals back to the CNS about how long the muscle is, and, uh, and there are e efferents to the spindle st uh, stimulating contractile elements within. The intrafusal efferents are motor neurons, uh, not the alpha motor neurons you're going to see in skeletal muscle. These are the gamma motor neurons, and they're stimulating these nuclear bag fibers and chain fibers, and these are the ones that contract. And I'm going to tell you how this works now. Just let me point out a few of these here for you. So these are the afferents uh, around the organ, and they're sending a signal back to the central nervous system, as you can see, going up this way. And uh, then when the central nervous system has decided that it needs to send a signal back, this would be an alpha motor neuron, uh, which is going to the skeletal muscle that we're normally thinking about. And this is the gamma efferent that's going to the contractile elements within the spindle. So let's talk about how this works. The spindle is uh, constantly sending signals up to the central nervous system, as you can see here. Deet, 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 deet. Uh, when the alpha motor neuron stimulates the skeletal muscle to contract, the belly shortens. So uh, the CNS now gets signals that the spindle is now slackened. Right here. Uh, and um, the gamma motor neuron now stimulates the contractile part of the spindle to shorten as well, removing the slack on it. And this is how the spindle works. It goes back to being deet, 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 deet again. Back to the alpha motor neurons. Also known as the anterior horn cell, it is the big cheese of the motor unit. The term motor unit refers to the anterior horn cell, its axonal projection, and all of its associated terminals, junctions, and muscle fibers. Here you see two uh, motor neurons, motor neuron one, motor neuron two, um, and it's uh, projecting to a muscle belly over here. The purple one has many neuromuscular junctions with a set of muscle fibers interdigitating between muscle fibers belonging to another motor neuron in red. Incidentally, the motor neuron determines whether the muscle fiber will be oxidative or anaerobic.
Damage to the upper motor neurons leads to a presentation that is labeled as the upper motor neuron syndrome. Weakness and paralysis occur due to the lost ability to initiate movement in the brain. Spasticity is defined as the velocity dependent increase in tone noted during range of motion exam. So if you passively move their arm or leg at a, at a joint slowly, you won't detect the change in tone as much as you will when you move it fast. This is directly related to the loss of connection to that spindle we talked about before. The hyperreflexia, clonus, and upgoing Babinski are also related to the disconnect of the peripheral nervous system from the upper motor neuron inhibitory effect. If you encounter the, this presentation on physical exam of an upper motor neuron syndrome, you have to consider a broad differential beyond just motor neuron disorders with more common issues such as spondylotic myelopathy or prior brain injury. Damage to the lower motor neurons results in weakness because they're carrying the signal from the upper motor neuron uh, to the muscle. As the connection to the muscle disappears, the muscle loses an inherent signal to stay alive, slowly atrophying until it's gone. This loss of muscle power leads to hyporeflexia. The electrodiagnostic testing we perform is actually excellent at assessing the peripheral nerves of which the lower motor neurons contribute. The differential diagnosis of motor neuron disease, especially of the lower motor neurons, includes cervical and lumbar spinal stenosis. This is an extremely common mimic of ALS. Cervical compression above C5 level will manifest in the upper motor neuron syndrome. Cervical stenosis often follows a stepwise progression, sometimes associated with periods of improvement. Uh, distinguishing it from ALS is um, neck or radicular pain, sensory loss, and back pain. Uh, evaluation of the face and thoracic paraspinal muscles are important when elect performing electrodiagnostic testing for this reason. Multifocal uh, motor conduction block uh, syndrome is a very important diagnosis because it clinically looks just like ALS but has a much better prognosis. It's an immune-mediated demyelination of the motor nerve. It's slowly progressive and begins distally with uh, fasciculations and cramps, usually presents in younger patients, less than 45 years of age, usually they're male, and the weakness is usually out of proportion to muscle atrophy, meaning there's not that much muscle atrophy because it's a conduction block. Uh, no upper motor neuron dysfunction is seen and reflexes are usually uh, low, depressed. Conduction block of peripheral nerves will be noted on electrodiagnostic testing. Benign fasciculation syndrome is a condition where there are frequent fasciculations beyond what is normally experienced and normal neurologic and electrodiagnostic examinations accompany this. There may be accompanying fatigue, cramps, and exercise intolerance, but there's no increased risk of developing significant neurologic disorders or of uh, eventually developing ALS. Um, you can have neuromuscular transmission disorders, myotonic syndromes, myopathies. So myotonic syndromes usually aren't confused with ALS except when the electromyographer misinterprets, misinterprets myotonic discharges as denervation potentials. Inclusion body myositis is a slowly progressive uh, weakness of distal muscles and proximal muscles, uh, which is usually symmetric. It has a predilection for uh, quadriceps and some more distal muscles like tibialis anterior, biceps, triceps, and the long finger flexors. Uh, usually there's facial and ocular sparing. Uh, they do commonly have trouble swallowing. It's uh, on electrodiagnostic testing, both myopathic and neuropathic motor unit action potentials that are seen, but fasciculations and cramps really aren't uh, present. Uh, you can have uncommon plexopathies, you know, <laughs> where if it's affecting multiple sides, that would be unique or rarer, and several concomitant mononeuropathies can exist in someone, but um, usually it's not going to have the upper motor neuron syndrome involved. So if we compare upper and lower motor neuron disorders in the central and peripheral nervous systems, both upper and lower motor neuron diseases present with weakness, which leads to atrophy and flaccidity in lower motor neuron conditions. Uh, reflexes are going to be pathological and hyperactive in the upper motor neuron syndrome, uh, normal or depressed in the typical lower motor neuron, and spasticity accompanies the upper motor neuron injuries. Finally, electrodiagnostic testing will only be beneficial with lower motor neuron conditions. Personally, there are three general clinical settings in which I encounter motor neuron diseases. The first is when it's being considered as a possible cause of some kind of clinical weakness. Second is someone considering it and they want uh, either electrodiagnostic testing or a second opinion from me. And finally, those that have already been diagnosed with a motor neuron disorder, um, and when I was in the VA, many times the veterans insurance wouldn't adequately cover their management needs and we would be part of the team offering them solutions along a continuum of care.
So I've arranged this in the same order as our histories and the oral boards. Uh, history is the first step in the diagnosis. Establish that there is a complaint of weakness somewhere in the body. Look for location of symptoms, onset, and whether there's progression. Look for a pattern of weakness. Pro is it more proximal? Is it more distal? Is it uh, both? Cramps are frequent complaints in um, uh, motor neuron disorders, uh, but myalgias, pain, tingling, burning are not typical. There are motor neuron disorders associated with cancer, infection, trauma, and meds, so it's a good idea to have all that information. Look for a family history uh, to assess the patient's ability to self-care and also level of support from family or community for planning long-term care or determining need for assistive devices. Also, uh, ask on review of systems about um, difficulty swallowing, respiratory muscle involvement, muscle twitches, change in speech. On exam, inspect the muscles for atrophy or fasciculations. Passive range of motion to detect contractures or change in tone. Manual muscle testing, reflexes, and you might note uh, waddling or lumbar lordosis. Uh, they may have a foot drop or slow scissoring gait, and your sensory exam should be normal. Muscle biopsy isn't routinely performed for suspected motor neuron diseases, but rather they're used to look for a, a suspected myopathy when it's being considered. But it will show signs of denervation atrophy on the uh, biopsy, as well as fiber type grouping. MRI and CAT scan can be helpful in a multi-level polyradiculopathy due to spondylotic spinal stenosis, which is a common mimic. CSF can have mildly elevated proteins on spinal tap, and serum CK can be mildly elevated as well but neither of these are as high as the other issues they're looking for, meaning GBS and myopathy, respectively. Electrodiagnostic testing, a composite uh, test of multiple tests, um, is usually pursued to confirm the presence of uh, active, uh, chronic and active denervation uh, in the affected limb, and even in clinically strong limbs, after history, exam, and labs have been performed. It's also used to rule out other disorders that we discussed, which may mimic. And it's important to note that nerve conductions will only assess the large myelinated fibers. The first part is usually nerve conduction studies, where a nerve is stimulated by an externally delivered uh, electrical impulse, and electrodes pick up the electrical activity uh, generated thereafter by muscle fibers of the muscle belly or the axo lamae of sensory neurons. Sensory nerve conduction studies should be normal in all, in all of the motor neuron diseases except Kennedy syndrome. Technical issues may affect the responses if there's swelling or obesity encountered. They can also be abnormal in advanced age or if there are concomitant mono or polyneuropathies. Motor studies will only be low amplitude if there's enough damage to outpace collateral sprouting and if the muscles tested in the hand and foot are involved. The velocities and latencies should be normal or are only mildly affected if there is profound axon loss. Of the delayed responses, H reflexes may be jumpier since these uh, are the, the, you'd normally see uh, hyperreflexia with the upper motor neuron syndrome, and this is the electrophysiologic version of that. F waves will be diminished if there are less motor neurons available to backfire, and since there are abundant collateral sprouts, low rate rep stem studies will probably be effective. Beyond nerve conduction studies, needle electromyography is a powerful and prevalent component of electrodiagnostic testing. A needle is inserted through the skin into the muscle and it acts as a microphone within and it displays the voltages that it detects. We document insertional activity. The needle electrode is inserted into a relaxed muscle and each advancement generates a brief burst of electrical activity. <laughs> This is absent when the needle is in fibrotic muscle or other tissue. It is increased whenever followed uh, for a variable pe period by other electrical activity. So here you can see this is normal insertional activity. And here, after the insertion and the needle is let go of, you, sa you see there is still some activity. So motor neuron diseases generally present with uh, increased insertional activity as demonstrated in this picture, where a short burst from the needle insertion is followed by activity. If the muscle is completely atrophied, you won't get that short burst, and it's called decreased insertional activity. Normally, electrical silence is seen as the needle is held fixed in a relaxed muscle. Uh, various types of spontaneous activity is seen if the patient is relaxed and we are not moving the needle. It's the fun pattern recognition part of electrodiagnosis, like recognizing uh, atrial fibrillation or VTAC on an EKG.
abnormal spontaneous activity in the form of positive sharp waves and fibrillation potentials is encountered due to the lost innervation of the muscle fibers. This may be the single most important finding in the electrodiagnosis of ALS, and its detection of these in multiple segments and root distributions in multiple limbs. That's important. Spontaneous small repetitive action potentials generated by healthy muscle fibers that have lost their nerve supply that fire with metronomic regularity of 1 to 10 hertz with biphasic spikes um, that form uh, if the tip of the needle recording electrode is near but not touching the muscle fiber. These are called fibrillation potentials. If it is touching, if the needle is touching the muscle fiber, positive sharp waves form. Although they can be seen with various myopathies, most often they're a cardinal sign of denervation as degeneration of just one motor axon can result in many fibrillations. They appear approximately 21 days after axon death and disappear if the muscle fiber is re-innervated or degenerates from lack of nerve supply, and the latter takes about 18 to 24 months. These will only be detectable when damage outpaces collateral sprouting from neighboring intact motor neurons. Aberrant discharges originating at the uh, irritable axonal membrane seen on needle exam are called fasciculation potentials, and these tend to be abundant in the context of motor neuron diseases. Usually, their diagnostic importance is determined by the context in which they appear. However, these have a pivotal role in the diagnosis of ALS. Spontaneous action potentials generated by motor units or por portions of motor units will result in fasciculation potentials, and they're a sign of irritation initiated anywhere along the portion of the intact motor unit. Complex repetitive discharges have bizarre configurations. They start and stop abruptly. They're nonspecific in nature and tend to be a sign of chronicity. Sometimes these are seen in patients who have slowly progressive ALS. Really, it's the uh, fibrillation potentials uh, that must be present in a widespread distribution. Lambert showed that uh, the likelihood of a particular muscle containing fibrillation potentials in ALS is directly related to its clinical strength. They're found appreciably more often in the more distal muscles than in the proximal muscles. Fasciculation potentials frequently are more restricted in their distribution as they can be generated only by intact motor units um, in less involved muscles. Uh, so these two types of potentials are found in inverse proportion in any given muscle. The motor unit action potential, or MUAP, uh, is the needle electrode detecting the summated electrical activity from the nearly synchronous activation of the individual muscle fibers that are innervated by one anterior horn cell. When a motor, ne when a motor neuron dies, a neighboring axon will collaterally sprout neurites and adopt the orphaned muscle fibers. This takes time, but as it's occurring, the connection to the muscle fibers is uh, immature and results in asynchronous firing with the rest of the motor unit. This results in a wide duration and complexity of morphology and eventually, when matured and synchronous, a large amplitude. And I really like this picture showing you how here you have two normal motor unit action potentials. And then when one of them dies, the other one starts collaterally sprouting. And you can see that the waveform changes starts becoming more serrated and phasic, uh, more phases are there, and it's wider duration, and eventually, yes, it is wide duration, um, less complex, and high amplitude. So with that uh, explanation given, here's what you can memorize in a denervation re setting. When looking at the configuration, we can look at internal and external characteristics. Internal configuration refers to the number of turns or phases, and these are usually increased in motor neuron diseases. External configuration consists of duration and amplitude, which are very uh, frequently increased because the process of collateral sprouting, uh, which is the adoption of uh, orphan muscle fibers adjacent, uh, by adjacent axons. As we said in the previous slide, this requires at least four to six months to develop. These are called chronic neurogenic MUAP changes. So-called giant MUAPs, which are greater than 10 millivolts, are uncommonly encountered. These are usually seen um, in very proximal lesions, uh, which are either static and long-standing or only very slowly progressive situations. Almost all chronic neurogenic MUAPs are polyphasic, uh, but in rapidly progressive ALS, unstable MUAPs reflect uh, recent re -innervation. And MUAP stability refers to the variation of appearance on repetitive firing as seen with early re uh, And you see this using trigger and delay. You'll see moment-to-moment -moment alterations um, in the motor unit action potential when uh, frozen on the screen, and this is referred to as instability. This is a sign of active disease, and it's a poor prognostic sign. Then we get to the firing characteristics, which include activation and recruitment. 
So normally, with normal activation, the motor unit action potential is act, uh, firing in a semi-regular fashion at 5 to 10 hertz. With upper motor neuron lesions, um, neuops will fire in decreased numbers at a slow to moderate rate. And um, it'll almost look the same as when someone's in pain or someone's faking that they're trying, uh, because basically this is a central nervous system issue. In a normal scenario, though, as patient effort increases, a second mu app is recruited. And it's also firing within this range, and progressively more are recruited. Um, the maximum frequency of 25 to 40 hertz elicits too many motor unit action potentials on the screen to observe individual firing uh, characteristics. But in um, peripheral nervous issues such as lower motor neuron diseases, you'll see a reduced recruitment uh, or decreased number of motor unit action potentials firing on maximal effort at a moderately rapid rate. And uh, th this occurs when we have either axon loss or demyelinating conduction block. Um, the converse of this is early recruitment, where there's a disproportionate number of motor unit action potentials relative to the amount of effort that's being given. And this is typically seen uh, with uh, myopathies. Um, reduced recruitment is invariably found from muscle to muscle in motor neuron diseases. And when muscles of the limb are influenced by both upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron lesion, the former controls the firing pattern. On the whole, the EMG picture of classic ALS is one of denervation, reinnervation, decreased activation, and decreased recruitment of motor unit action potentials in mu multiple muscles innervated by different nerves uh, in different myotomes. It's not unusual to sample all four limbs, the paraspinal muscles, and the bulbar muscles when doing needle examination. Thoracic paraspinal involvement, for example, in ALS, is approximately 78% compared with 5% of the normal population. So it's really important to check these other areas, uh, bulbar and thoracic. Widespread denervation and reinnervation can be observed even if symptoms are restricted to one or two limbs. Active findings must be found in three of four body segments and be unexplained by other diagnoses. Spontaneous activity in the form of fibrillation potentials Positive sharp waves and fasciculations are usually prominent, uh, but complex repetitive discharges are unusual. The criteria for diagnosing ALS uh, in EMG are presented here. Notice that it's essentially uh, what I said in the prior slides. Lambert is given uh, credit for this, and it goes all the way back to 1957. The Lambert criteria were widely employed since then, but may have been too strict. A more recent subcommittee on motor neuron disease on the of the federal of the World Federation of Neurology uh, it was held in El Escorial in 1980 to enable diagnosis in the earlier stages for research drug uh, research and drug treatment protocols. The downside is that it's it's more confusing. Again, Lambert in 1969 may have been too stringent. El Escorial in 1990 may have been too confusing and was thought to have several flaws. There was an Arley House revision of El Escorial in 1998 where they uh, agreed upon the most commonly used criteria, and they considered L. escorial insufficiently sensitive, and they favored clinical over electrodiagnostic findings. Finally, in 2006, there was this uh, Awaji Shima criteria. These were modifications to L. escorial uh, off and offered that electrodiagnostic uh, findings were equal to clinical findings, and that fasciculation potentials were equal to fibs and positive sharp waves. The criteria are useful to know, and you know there's still no real universal agreement, and we're still taking more data in. Um, and you really just can't say in your report uh, that it's definite. You can say findings are consistent with a widespread disorder of the anterior horn cells, such as as seen with uh, ALS. So keeping these in mind, you're in good company if you feel confused at what uh, you can use as uh, diagnostic criteria. Uh, Asa Wilborn says many exams are indeterminate, where they may show some abnormalities but not sufficient for a diagnosis. Uh, usually this is because active denervation is not widespread enough. The report should say that a definite diagnosis cannot be provided. The clinical diagnosis of ALS simply cannot be confirmed by this examination, and a repeat examination can be performed usually six months later. Next, we move on to the second part of this lecture which is a laundry list of all of the different motor neuron diseases and how to memorize them. Start by memorizing the four categories.
acquired idiopathic is the high yield category, which includes ALS. Uh, the hereditary motor neuron disorders include SMA. Uh, and if you see a geriatric problem like I did, uh, a geriatric population like I did, the multi-system disorders are useful to be familiar with. And finally, known causes will surprise you and be interesting to cite on rounds. Like I said, that's my way, but there are plenty of other classification schemes you can follow, like this one in these two slides. So the acquired idiopathic motor neuron diseases include the most common one, which is ALS. This includes upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron, bulbar and somatic. Progressive muscular atrophy, or PMA, is idiopathic lower motor neuron disease only, and primary lateral sclerosis is idiopathic upper motor neuron disease only. If just the face is affected, or if only one limb, it's either progressive bulbar palsy or monomelic amyotrophy, respectively, and there are many ALS variants. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is most often encountered as a sporadic uh, progressive degenerative disorder of unknown etiology that characteristically affect both upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons, but spares sensory and autonomic function. It's named by Jean-Martin Charcot in 1869, meaning no nourishment to the muscle and scarring, commonly referred to as Lou Gehrig's disease after the famous baseball player who died of the condition in 1941. Approximately 10% are familial. Most frequently it occurs in age 55 to 60 years old with a slight male pre predominance. Uh, usually one body segment is affected and then progresses to adjacent myotomes insidiously, and then it spreads to the contralateral limb. Ultimately, it progresses to bulbar and respiratory muscles. Death usually results from uh, respiratory insufficiency or from medical complications of uh, prolonged uh, inactivity. Uh, upper motor neuron dysfunction manifests as stiffness, slowness of movement, spasticity, weakness, pathologic hyperreflexia, and Babinski responses, like we talked about. And we also talked about how lower motor neuron dysfunction includes atrophy, weakness, fasciculations, and cramps. The mean duration of illness from symptom onset through death is approximately three years. However, about 10% follow a more benign course, surviving for many more years. It's unusual to see sensory complaints, disturbances of cognitive uh, function, vision, hearing, or autonomic signs. Rarely there is an associated frontotemporal dementia and uh, late in the course spasticity affects the bladder, creating urinary urgency and frequency. I talked about the 10% that have a benign course. It was ironic that on a day that I gave this lecture and I usually showed this slide about prognosis was the day we heard that Dr. Hawking died. In terms of mortality, most people will agree that bulbar involvement, bulbar onset, impaired early impairment of forest vital capacity and older age at diagnosis have all been associated with shorter survival and poorer prognosis. Um, in uh, one study of prognosis, the highest mortality was observed in the second year after diagnosis. Mortality declined sharply if a patient survived diagnosis for six or more years. After adjusting for simultaneously effective variables, older age at diagnosis, shorter time to diagnosis, and bulbar or truncal onset were strongly associated with shorter survival. Most of the increased mortality in older patients proved to be uh, caused by a rise of excess uh, mortality, but not by changes in background mortality. Um, patients presenting with truncal weakness had the shortest survival of two months after diagnosis. Bulbar onset was an independent prognostic factor in males only. Irrespective of the site of onset or age, they found the presence of truncal weakness, dysarthria, or fasciculations of spinal muscles at diagnosis was associated with shorter survival. Primary lateral sclerosis um, is the upper motor neuron uh, only version. It's a very rare disorder of selective upper motor neuron involvement characterized by spasticity, weakness, pathologically increased reflexes, and pseudo-bulbar speech and affect. It's commonly uh, presents as progressive paraplegia or quadriplegia, tetraplegia. Uh, prolonged course, but better prognosis than ALS. And uh, there was a... Uh, study in 2006 that showed that if you don't develop any lower motor neuron signs uh, after about approximately four years, then it was a good chance you're not going to uh, convert from PLS to ALS. Progressive muscular atrophy, um, approximately 15% of sporadic motor neuron diseases present with this pure lower motor neuron syndrome of distal limb wasting and weakness, uh, and uh, they get fasciculations, cramps, and it's a long, slow progression uh, to proximal limb muscles. Uh, bulbar involvement is unusual. The uh, 
acquired idiopathic motor neuron disease that affects one limb is called monomelic amyotrophy of the distal upper extremity. It has many other names, including Hirayama's disease. It's a monophasic condition disproportionately affecting young males 18 to 22 of South Asian, Middle Eastern, or Asian descent. Patients develop insidious, progressive, painless weakness of one limb, typically with atrophy of the hand progressing to the forearm due to uh, anterior horn cell loss. The course is generally benign. Uh, patients with Hirayama disease often show transient aggravation of muscle weakness in the affected muscle group with exposure to cold. This phenomenon is called cold paresis, and it's seen in 97% of them versus 15% in ALS. Uh, interestingly, brachioradialis is characteristically spared. Uh, they most often present with weakness in the lower cervical myotomes of the C8 T1 innervated muscles, which is often asymmetric. And this weakness causes marked functional loss of the intrinsic hand and distal upper limb muscles. Serum CK may be slightly elevated. On nerve conduction studies, asymmetrically low median or ulnar CMAP amplitudes in the affected hand will be seen while snaps are preserved. Needle electromyography findings are consistent with denervation and less severe electrodiagnostic findings may be seen in clinically unaffected limbs. Despite the widespread needle EMG findings, clinical progression to the contralateral limb is less common. Uh, motor unit action potentials are large and prolonged in duration and recruitment is reduced. Low amplitude, short duration MUAPs occur in approximately 20% of patients. Um, and they can be seen in the uh, clinically unaffected contralateral limb. In the majority of cases, weakness progresses uh, with the affected limb for less than five years and then stabilizes. Uh, on imaging, uh, you can see segmental atrophy of the spinal cord in the lower cervical and upper thoracic cord. Cervical spine MRI um, on this one shows uh, bi uh, focal bilateral asymmetric high T2 signal lesions in the anterior horns at multiple contiguous levels of the lower cervical spine, resembling a pair of dice. Uh, and it, you're not seeing it here, but it was on the axial cord, and that's called uh, snake eyes sign, which have been described in spondylotic myelopathy, infectious focal myelitis, post-polio syndrome, post-asthmatic amyotrophy, and monomelic amyotrophy. Uh, so take a moment to pause this slide and read the captions. This slide collects a number of ALS variants described in the motor neuron disease chapter of Bradham, which I will not be going over. We now move on to the hereditary motor neuron diseases. We just fig finished the acquired idiopathic, um, and I've organized them for you here. We already discussed familial ALS. Um, then we have the board relevant SMA1 through SMA4, which range from floppy baby to adult onset weakness. Uh, one that I have seen during my career and does come up on your boards deserves more attention, and that is Kennedy disease. It's an X-linked recessive hereditary slow pro slowly progressive motor neuron disease that affects males in their third to fifth decade. There's an expanded CAG or CAG repeat in the androgen receptor gene. This is especially interesting because it has an associated uh, sensory neuropathy. So snaps are affected in the upper extremities and lower extremities. Slow progression of exercise induced cramps, hand tremors, followed by weakness of the proximal muscles, followed by bulbar involvement and later distal muscle involvement. Uh, the bulbar part is dysarthria, dysphagia, and facial fasciculations, and these are made more prominent with contraction, uh, and that's seen in 90% of cases. Reflexes are hypoactive or absent, and sensation should be normal. Most patients have gynecomastia and or other endocrine abnormalities. CK is moderately elevated, uh, 500 to 1500, and um, you may see grouped repetitive motor unit discharges with mild activation in facial, muscle, facial muscles. Um, DNA testing for androgen receptor gene with the uh, expansion of the CAG repeat is actually available. Uh, another one uh, emphasized in Bradham was progressive bulbar paralysis, and sometimes this can uh, uh, progress to ALS. We move on to a new category, which are the multi-system disorders. I have seen a number of shy Drager uh, cases, which is profound Parkinson's, autonomic dysfunction, and motor neuron dysfunction. I have slides covering these other ones. Uh, adult onset hexosaminidase A deficiency is also known as late uh, onset Tay-Sachs disease. It's a rare partial deficiency in hexosaminidase A, which is a lysosomal enzyme that breaks down gangliosides. And this leads to abnormal ganglioside accumulation and then nerve cell degeneration. 
but this is a juvenile or adult onset Ashkenazi associated lower limb weakness, cramping uh, with widespread fasciculations. You'll see denervation on EMG, uh, proximal greater than uh, distal initially in the lowers more than the uppers with the predilection for triceps. Most patients also have a coexistent cerebellar disturbance with dysarthria, ataxia, dysmetria, and about half have psychiatric dis disturbance such as psychosis or depression. Uh, normal motor and sensory studies will be seen. Abnormal spontaneous activity, including fasciculations and fibrillation potentials, will be seen on EMG, and it'll be especially prominent complex repetitive discharges. You may also see large polyphasic muaps with reduced recruitment. Hereditary spastic paraplegia um, basically is a diverse group of disorders with variable clinical presentation. They can be classified either by the type of inherent, inheritance or um, the type of spasticity. And uh, I will not be going into detail on these, uh, but here I have um, offered some of them. For completion's sake, the glycogen branching enzyme gene mutation leads to a bunch of amylose buildup in adult polyglucosan body disorder, which I've uh, provided you here. Now we go to the known causes, and there are a bunch of them which are fun to know and encouraging because you can actually treat them if present. This is probably not super board relevant, but I found it fascinating. Latherism is uh, toxicity from a certain type of uh, pea, chickpea. It's uh, actually called uh, a grass pea, and it grows well under drought conditions and is sometimes the only food available in parts of Ethiopia, Pakistan, India, and Nepal. It's nutritious and high in protein, but it contains a neurotoxin that causes paralysis, particularly of the legs. They'll get 15 minute bouts of foot supination cramping precipitated by physical activity. 40% uh, of the time it's subacute, 10% of the time it's insidious, progressive loss of gait. They'll also have spasticity, clonus, paresthesias, dorsal column and anterior horn degeneration with uh, neural eosinophilic inclusions. Um, People in affected areas can either die of starvation or risk living the rest of their lives um, as unable to uh, uh, comfortably walk. So the neurotoxin is not highly dangerous unless the grass pea is a major part of the diet for a period of time. It has to be about 30 to 40 percent of your diet for two to six months. Uh, that's fortunate because in India and uh, Nepal, grass pea is often used as a cheap adulterant in uh, pigeon peas, which is also known as tuvar or tuvar, uh, or Bengal chickpeas, which are known as chana. It's often uh, uh, prepped as a dal, which is peeled and split, uh, and it's more di difficult to detect than when it's in its whole grass pea form. Uh, or it'll be in the form of flour, basin, which is just about impossible to detect. So it's a certain grass pea that will continue to be used as human food because nothing else grows satisfactorily under the same conditions. So scientists are working to breed and distribute low neurotoxin varieties. Um, the next one is motor neuron dis diseases associated with electrical injury. Exposure to an electrical injury from lightning or high voltage lines or household circuits will cause transient neurologic deficits immediately after that. Usually they'll recover within uh, several days and is due to trauma to the nerves. Weakness will begin near the site of the trauma and progress to a typical ALS uh, with the deaths typically occurring within three years of initial presentation. Uh, it's very sad um, and it's something you have to be on the lookout for. Paraneoplastic uh, associations with motor neuron disease as well. ALS can occur with cancer by chance, just bad luck. 10% of ALS will have uh, monoclonal gammopathy suggestive of lymphoproliferative disorder. Uh, you can get a subacute uh, motor neuropathy. Um, you can have paraneoplastic encephalomyelitis and sensory neuropathy. Uh, paraneoplastic motor neuron disease. You can have motor neuron disease uh, due to radiation or induced by radiation, made worse by radiation. So I've grayed this all out because it's a little extensive for the boards, but it is something good to be aware of. Here are the infectious etiologies of motor neuron diseases, and we're going to go through them. Paralytic poliomyelitis is uh, best regarded as a clinical syndrome that can be caused by a variety of viruses, not simply the poliovirus. Um, it has drastically been reduced from 15,000 cases per year to rare cases associated with you know, the live attenuated vaccine, travel or endemic areas, and incomplete immunization status. 
It presents with fever, headache, myalgias, and GI disturbances, uh, followed two weeks later by asymmetric lower limb weakness, wasting, and depressed reflexes. Uh, sensation, autonomics, uh, bulbar, and respiratory uh, are spared, and the motor neurons um, will die. Uh, any recovery of strength that occurs is due to collateral sprouting by intact motor neurons. So if polio ain't around anymore, then um, why, why should we learn it? Uh, there's something called post-polio syndrome, which is characterized by slow progressive fatigue, arthralgia, pain, cramps, fasciculations, and atrophy about 15 years after stability had already been achieved. And usually this was in previously affected muscle groups 25 to 30 years after the acute uh, polio attack. Uh, as I said, the motor neurons died and collateral sprouting led to some recovery of strength. The syndrome is attributed to normal loss of motor neurons during aging at, after about age 55, superimposed on chronically denervated muscles uh, or sick motor neurons that are now giving up the adopted muscle fibers. Usually EMG is used to exclude a new superimposed process. Uh, your SNAPs will be normal, your CMAPs and um, your F waves and your rep stim will also be normal if uh, not atrophied, uh, although overuse compression may manifest. Uh, you can have increased size motor unit action potentials up to 20 millivolts uh, in uninvolved muscles as well. You'll see increased jitter, increased fiber density, increased macro mu apps. Uh, uh, when I was a resident, this was presenting a lot, and there was sometimes a question of, uh, hey, is this person malingering, or is there secondary gain driving these cases? West Nile encephalitis is caused by a single-stranded RNA flavivirus transmitted by common mosquito bite, uh, rarely by transplants and blood products, and it's usually in summer and early fall. Only about one out of 150 infections result in neurologic involvement, uh, and it's usually the elderly or immunocompromised that are highest risk. Usually it's a flu-like illness, four-week history of retroorbital pain, facial congestion, rash, malaise, low-grade fever, and altered mental status. The motor neuron disease is diffuse weakness in all four limbs. There may be encephalitis, meningitis, and myelitis occurring and may present with uh, monoplegia, flaccid quadriplegia, uh, bulbar weakness, respiratory weakness, segmental flaccid paralysis, or diffuse weakness. And uh, you may see these people after they've been in the ICU already. Electrodiagnostic testing demonstrates uniformly low um, compound muscle action potential amplitudes and normal sensory responses. Needle examination shows spontaneous activity and decreased motor unit potential recruitment in multiple nerve root distributions in the arms and legs as well as thoracic paraspinal muscles. Retrovirus associated motor neuron disorders. You know, rarely HIV can present uh, mimicking classic ALS, PLS, uh, or a restricted lower motor neuron disorder. HIV can pretty much mimic anything neurological. Unfortunately, um, you'll get, fortunately, you'll get complete remission when you treat the infection. HTLV1 associated myelopathy or HAM or tropical spastic paraparesis is a well-established motor neuron disease. The virus can also cause peripheral neuropathy, chronic polymyositis, and uh, usually in this case, um, you will see um, somatosensory, uh, brain auditory, and uh, visual evoke potential issues. Finally, the dreaded subacute spongiform encephalopathy or Creutzfeldt uh, Jakob disease, which is caused by an abnormal prion producing widespread gliosis, neuron loss, and vacuolization of the cortex cord and cerebellum. It causes rapid progressive mental uh, ictal motor visual deterioration and death within a year. Um, and there'll be this vague prodrome of fatigue, altered sleep and appetite, upper motor neuron and movement disorders. One to two million occur, one to two per million per year um, was the rate I last saw. Although this comes up in these motor neuron dis disorder discussions, I think of this more as a central nervous system infection. I did see it in one patient and his issues were not more motor neuron like it was more of the um, uh, dementia and um, rapidly progressive mental and cognitive issues. We all learn in medical school about Tabes dorsalis related to syphilis, which I've summarized here. Neurosyphilis occurs in appro approximately 20% of untreated syphilitics, um, approximately greater than 10 years later. 
with general paresis and progressive loss of mental function. Tabes dorsalis is the dorsal root ganglion and posterior column destruction we, re we memorized. Uh, nerve conduction studies are going to be normal, and the EMG shows denervation of the gastrox. So now we're on the third and final section of this talk. If you've made it this far, you need a life. <laughs> This is where we go over what the physiatrist can do to help manage patients with ALS. We already touched on this, but sometimes you're the one dependent upon for confirmation of the diagnosis. Because of the gravity of these diseases, unless the diagnosis is confirmed by DNA testing, in sporadic ALS, a second diagnostic opinion really should be the rule. A physiatrist is well suited by training to oversee a comprehensive, uh, goal-oriented treatment plan uh, and direct the rehabilitation team. Patient and family education is critical and should be done uh, at the initial clinic evaluation. The patient should be thoroughly educated about prognosis, expected outcomes, and what problems may be encountered. If applicable, enrollment in an experimental drug trial should be encouraged and facilitated. Um, this furthers science and provides hope for the patient. The physiatrist uh, should then assess the patient's goals and orchestrate a rehabilitative or palliative program that matches these goals. In ALS and severe forms of SMA, palliative care should be aimed at maximizing uh, patient's comfort and quality of life, but not necessarily extending his or her uh, life. In children and adolescents with SMA, care must be taken to address developmental issues, including body image uh, and self-esteem. Um, further, in SMA and familial ALS, uh, the patients and parents of affected children should be uh, referred for genetic counseling. Okay. Rehabilitation uh, strives to develop a person uh, to his or her maximum uh, physical and psychosocial capacity within the limits of the physiologic impairment and environmental limitations. Goals are determined by the patient and those involved uh, with his care. Aggressive rehabilitation that includes management of respiratory failure using uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation and dysphagia via gastrostomy tube placement can prolong the life of the patient with ALS longer than any pharmacologic inter interventions. As researchers develop additional drugs that slow degrees disease progression in ALS and other motor neuron diseases, life expectancy will increase and rehabilitation will become even more important. Uh, comprehensive motor neuron disease medical care should include rehabilitation that restores the patient to a level of optimal functioning in his or her normal societal environment and allows as high a quality of life as possible. Rehabilitation is a fluid process for patients with ALS because of their rapidly changing physical status. Consequently, rehabilitation is more challenging than it is for patients with static functional deficits produced by events such as stroke or spinal cord injury. One of the most difficult tasks for the rehabilitation team is to predict how quickly the patient's disease will progress. It's crucial to attempt to do this to stay ahead of the disease. By looking at the course of disease progression, health professionals can help the patient avoid purchasing equipment that will no longer be useful by the time it arrives. You know, two class two studies and one class three study showed that multidisciplinary clinics specializing in ALS uh, care are probably effective in several ways. Increased use of adaptive equipment, increased utilization of riluzole, PEG, and non-invasive ventilation, improved quality of life, and lengthened survival. However, one class two study with low use of treatments found no survival benefit. Therapies at each state of motor neuron disease uh, should be implemented. 1978, Sanaki and Mulder described six stages of ALS, which is still used as guide in formulating therapies and treatment. Stage one, uh, they're independent in mobility and activities of daily living. So you want to avoid overuse and fatigue. You want to teach them to pace appropriately, energy conservation, emphasize education, psychologic support, home safety evaluation, and um, active range of motion, submaximal aerobic strengthening, and general conditioning. As they progress through the stages, the exercises continue, but the balance between strengthening and fatigue have to constantly be reassessed. Three forms of exercise training are relevant to patients with ALS, flexibility, strengthening, and aerobic exercise. Skeletal muscle weakness is the primary impairment in ALS and causes most of the clinical problems associated with ALS. The role of exercise used to be controversial. Traditionally, physicians have been reluctant to recommend strengthening exercises because the fear that overuse weakness is going to occur accelerating disability. 
So this philosophy promotes the development of disuse weakness and muscle deconditioning, which may compound the weakness produced by ALS itself. There may be some deleterious effects, but there's no scientific data to support this. Some form is both physically and psychologically beneficial throughout the disease process. A therapist should be consulted to instruct on appropriate routines in the early stages of the disease when independent in mobility and ADLs. A specific group of muscles are mildly weak, which may be manifested as limitations in performance uh, or endurance or both. Therapy consists of patient and caregiver education, energy conservation training, modification of the home and workplace, and psychological support. The patient is advised to continue normal physical activities, general active range of motion and stretching of affected joints, resistive strengthening exercises of unaffected muscles with low to moderate weights, and aerobic activities such as swimming, walking, bicycling, all at submaximal levels. These, sh these should be prescribed. Later in the disease, rehabilitation strategies such as the provision of assistive devices must be used to maintain function and compensate um, for muscle weakness. Uh, children with SMA should be channeled into a neurodevelopmental program as soon as possible after diagnosis and maintained in exercise programs centered around active play and functional activities as tolerated. In SMA2, the disease may be too severe to allow much physical exercise and in cases with severe respiratory involvement, the work of breathing may be the biggest exercise limiting factor. So aerobic conditioning, uh, this helps maintain cardiorespiratory fitness. The oxygen cost of exercise compared with controls at similar intensity levels was increased in patients with ALS probably because spasticity increases energy consumption. One study looking at blood levels of exercise markers suggested a possible defect in lipid metabolism during exercise or physical deconditioning. Otherwise, overall, uh, heart rate and ventilatory responses to exercise were similar to those seen in controls. Given the lack of any apparent contraindication, aerobic exercise training is recommended for patients with ALS as long as it can be performed safely without a risk of falling or injury. In addition to the physical benefits, uh, this form of exercise often has a beneficial effect on mood, psychological well-being, appetite, and sleep. As motor neuron diseases progress, uh, strengthening and aerobic exercise eventually become impossible, and at this point, it's an important aspect of rehabilitation, helping the patient maintain independent mobility uh, as long as they can. Uh, I, I do give a whole lecture on the evidence supporting exercise in neuromuscular patients, which you can find elsewhere on YouTube if you're interested in a deep dive. Spasticity is a problem in ALS, but not in other forms of motor neuron diseases. It's induced both at the motor cortex and at the spinal cord level. Loss of higher order inhibition produces spasticity, which is worse in patients with the predominance of upper motor neuron findings. Because the upper motor neurons are preserved in SMA, spastic spasticity isn't a problem. But in ALS, it may actually improve if the disease progresses to involve lower motor neurons because now, they're, now you're weak. So treatment is only offered when it interferes with function. Non-pharmacologic management involves teaching patients stretching exercise and positioning techniques that decrease muscle tone. Slow, 30-second sustained static muscle stretching may be helpful, particularly in the more symptomatic muscle groups like the gastrocnemius, and they may be done in bed. Positional splinting is a helpful adjunctive modality, but uh, skin has to be monitored frequently for pressure areas. In general, pharmacologic management of spasticity is less successful in ALS than in multiple sclerosis or spinal cord injury because the lower motor neuron component of ALS makes patients extremely susceptible to, develop, to the development of excessive weakness. So uh, there's also baclofen, tizanidine, diazepine, diazepam, um, uh, unfortunately, um, dantrolene is uh, not a good idea because it does lead to excessive uh, weakness from uh, the muscle being affected. So flexibility training involves stretching and range of motion exercises. It's widely accepted that this form of exercise helps prevent the development of painful contractures and non-pharmacologically decreases spasticity and aborts painful muscle spasms that are common in ALS. It's especially important to maintain shoulder range of motion when the patient can no longer actively raise their arms overhead. Uh, loss of range of motion can uh, cause re regional pain syndromes, frozen shoulder syndromes, uh, contractors develop in SMA2 and non-ambulatory SMA3 in ALS patients. Uh, contractors of the hip, knee, elbow, and wrist are, can also be common. Uh, with the exception of a painful frozen shoulder, contractors rarely become a clinical problem in ALS because of the limited lifespan of these patients. And uh, initial management includes things like daily standing and walking, range of motion, like we said, uh, supportive splinting. So 
finally, spinal deformity, specifically scoliosis, occurs greater th in greater than 75% of SMA2 patients and almost always occurs in the first decade of life. The vast majority of the curves are thoracolumbar, and in severe scoliosis, um, kyphosis will usually be present as, as well. Spinal bracing can be used to improve sitting posture and balance, but spinal arthrodesis is the only effective treatment for scoliosis in SMA. Uh, for children more than 10 years of age, curve exceeding 60 degrees, spinal instrumentation with posterior fusion uh, is probably the definitive treatment of choice. And although most patients are satisfied with the outcome, some studies did report a decline in functional activities following the surgery. Uh, these declines were usually in very weak patients and probably just represent the natural progression of the disease combined with some uh, deconditioning associated with the immobility following surgery. Uh, Post-surgical mobilization is probably really important for that reason. An occupational therapist can help with motor neuron disease patients, uh, help them remain independent as long as possible in, sp in spite of upper motor uh, neuron and upper extremity weakness. Uh, they can be taught en energy conservation techniques provided with dressing aids and given adapted utensils and writing tools. Um, uh, helping them continue their work, pursue their hobbies and interests as long as possible, despite the weakness, uh, is a big reason for the, um, the team to be involved. Um, you can have lifts for transfers. Fully electric hospital beds can help make uh, position, positioning easier and provide pressure relief. Um, you can instruct on the importance of turning every two hours to decrease the risk of skin breakdown. A mattress overlay uh, may be indicated as well. Toileting becomes difficult despite retained bowel and bladder function. After understanding the level of function, available assistance, and home environment, a variety of equipment can be provided, uh, including raised toilet seat with armrests, bedside commode, urinal, protective undergarments, indwelling, or condom catheters. Uh, some patients will start to limit their oral intake in the hope of requiring fewer trips to the commode, as it can be a very stressful activity, and this can affect nutrition. Um, challenge of bathing, it's also uh, an issue, and uh, bathroom modification, specialized equipment, tub bench, handheld shower, sponge baths can all be uh, offered. Feeding, um, you know, uh, assistance with feeding can also be given with a mobile arm support or balanced forearm orthosis uh, for those with proximal uh, upper extremity weakness, built up utensils, uh, angled shape. Uh, you can stick playing cards and things, rocker knives, lightweight mugs. These can be helpful for self-feeding. Uh, dressing techniques, uh, button hooks, Velcro straps, you name it. Uh, main thing is um, trying to decrease the time and energy consumed with dressing. Assistive devices for ambulation can be prescribed progressively, beginning with uh, straight cane or quad canes, walkers, rolling walkers, wheelchairs for those who can ambulate only for short distances or who were non-ambulatory. Uh, lightweight portable wheelchairs are probably most appropriate and should provide adequate support. Recommended features for most patients with motor neuron diseases include removable arms, a removable lap tray, removable leg rests, uh, a solid seat with a gel or foam cushion, and flexibility, flexibility that will allow mounting of a ventilator tray, balanced form, forearm orthosis if needed, or communication device if needed. Solid back will improve trunk alignment and help prevent shoulder and back dysfunction more than a sling type back. Children are frequently placed in larger wheelchairs to allow room for growth, but this can uh, increase the risk of contractures, joint deformities, um, because insurers will generally only purchase one wheelchair for a patient. It's advisable to rent or borrow a light foldable chair initially and reserve insurance funds for purchase of a definitive chair, which should have a high back, reclining back, or tilt and space capability and appropriate head and neck support. The decision uh, about whether or not to purchase a power chair is influenced by cost, availability of transportation for the chair, maneuverability in the home. Um, they used to say a five foot uh, turning radius, radius is generally required and um, home accessibility via ramps. Uh, cognitive assessment should uh, precede prescription of powered mobility. A scooter won't provide the support needed and you should incorporate mechanisms for pressure relief, facilitation of transfers, production, um, uh, protection against dependent edema and uh, specialty drive controls that can be adjusted as needed. Uh, although this offers greater opportunity for activity, comfort, and maneuverability, it is more difficult to load and transport, and it is expensive. Many rehab centers have uh, brace clinics that are staffed by a team of 
consisting of an orthotist, a physical therapist, and a physiatrist. In general, you want to go with the lightest materials. Um, braces uh, with metal uprights may uh, be too heavy and may further impair uh, gait. Uh, for similar reasons, long leg braces like CAFOs, knee, ankle, foot orthoses, rarely work for patients with motor neuron diseases. If the knee is too weak to be stabilized, by setting the ankle of an AFO in slight plantar flexion, ambulation is probably not a reasonable expectation. Four of the most commonly used AFOs for patients with motor neuron diseases are off-the-shelf brace, the posterior leaf spring brace, the solid ankle foot orthosis, and the articulated ankle foot orthosis. So the off-the-shelf AFO is recommended for those with very rapidly progressing disease who are expected to ambulate for only a few more weeks or months Waiting for a custom AFO to be constructed in that time may deprive these patients uh, of a significant portion of the remaining period of ambulation. The posterior leaf spring brace, it's awesome, has a fairly flexible ankle and is suitable for those who need minimal assistance with dorsiflexion or have primarily upper motor neuron dysfunction, causing them to catch their toes. This brace does not provide any medial or lateral stability, unlike the solid AFO, which has an inflexible ankle used with uh, severe dorsiflexion and plantar flexion weakness. Uh, it can be used to improve knee stability when the quadriceps are weak. Uh, Bilateral solid AFOs, when there's proximal weakness, can make it hard to rise from a chair. The articulated AFO works best for those with good plantar flexors and quadriceps strength, but severe dorsiflexor weakness. It's also sometimes useful for those with spasticity and a foot drop caused by an extensor synergy pattern. Extra features that can be built into the AFO to decrease sp spasticity include a full foot plate, a buildup under the metatarsal heads, and medial longitudinal arch. You can also put in a peroneal ridge and um, uh, a solid ankle. An experienced team is best equipped to pres prescribe these uh, the most appropriate brace for the given individual. You can also get creative with braces. Um, so if they have a head drop and the cervical foam collar is too hot, you can advise a headmaster collar. This just keeps their head up. They can also get something called a um, baseball cap orthosis, trial and error. Communication is fundamental to effective participation in life, especially sharing social closeness. Speech difficulties are common in ALS. A patient's spouse or friends will often notice changes in voice pattern before the patient does. Early changes include a higher pitch or more nasal tone to the speech or a hoarseness followed by progressive difficulty with actual articulation. Having a speech therapist teach uh, adaptive strategies such as over-articulation and slow speaking rate can, may manage um, early or mild dysarthria, but um, if they have hypernasal speech caused by pal palatal weakness and primarily lower motor neuron dysfunction, a palatal lift and or augmentation prosthesis often imp improve speech clarity. As dysarthria worsens, they're going to require alternate forms. Writing, if they can't write, um, they can use um, a voice synthesizer. Um, they can uh, try uh, typing or some other form of pointer like a head stick or mouth stick um, with a laptop computer. Uh, there's scanning systems um, and you can use switches which can be very pressure sensitive, pillow switches, EMG triggered switches, infrared beams, eye gaze switches. Uh, you can activate with your extraocular muscles. Their research is now currently being conducted on the use of EEG signal to operate switches that would enable those who have lost extraocular movement to communicate just by thinking about it. Um, you know, technology is great, but older patients who aren't computer literate may find computerized devices intimidating. Um, everything that you want to try really should be borrowed first, if possible, before purchasing it. So if you, you can tell if it really will be useful to them. The portability of the devices is also extremely important. Sialuria, or drooling, is a common problem in patients with ALS with bulbar symptoms due to difficulty controlling and swallowing the amount of saliva that is normally present in the oral cavity. Therefore, it's not extra um, uh, saliva being made. Although drooling is not life-threatening, you know, a patient perceives this as a major problem because of social embarrassment and the clinician should treat it aggressively. The initial treatment may be behavioral, including having the patient avoid foods that increase saliva. Generally, these would be salty or highly spiced foods, using mouth swabs and attempting more frequent swallows. Second line therapy includes anticholinergic medication, um, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, glycopyrrolate, trihexafenidyl, 
Um, a suction machine can also help. Um, uh, injecting Botox A into the salivary glands to improve saliva management in ALS has been reported as successful. If it's severe, transtympanic, um, uh, what's it called? Transtympanic uh, neurectomy, which blocks the parasympathetic innervation of the salivary glands or uh, Stenson duct ligation can be tried, but these procedures have limited success. Radiation to the salivary glands has been tried, but lots of problems come with that as well. Um, you can try dark grape juice and papaya tablets. Both of these contain enzymes that may help thicken secretions, and guaifenesin is also known to, um, in liquid form or pill form to be helpful. Dysphagia is uh, difficulty... Uh, swallowing and is most common in ALS, but may also be seen in SMA as well. Uh, if they present with uh, uh, early with speech difficulties, you should be monitoring them for swallowing problems as well. Adequate swallowing function is necessary to maintain nutritional status. Uh, if nutritional status is not properly maintained, they lose. Uh, they tend to use muscle protein as fuel, and thus lose muscle mass for that reason earlier. So there's a sevenfold increased risk of death. Uh, in patients with malnutrition, um, and swallowing dysfunction may also precipitate aspiration pneumonia and or respiratory failure. So early signs and symptoms of dysphagia are the drooling that we just talked about, a wet voice, a coughing during or after drinking thin liquids, nasal regurgitation, and requiring an excessive amount of time to complete meals. This figure outlines a clinical algorithm for dysphagia management. Uh, patients should be referred to a speech pathologist when the first signs of dysphagia develop. A modified barium swallow or fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing safety assesses the phases of swallowing and can pinpoint areas of dysfunction and identifies silent aspiration. And we really do want to reduce the risk of aspiration and choking. Recommendations uh, can be modification of food consistencies, high calorie uh, nutritional supplements, for those having difficulty maintaining um, the development of aspiration pneumonia, loss of greater than 10% of body weight, and the need for excessive amount of time to eat such that quality of life is impaired are all indications for feeding tube placement. Uh, a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tube or PEG tube is recommended uh, when a feeding tube is indicated. PEG tubes are used in SMA too to help children grow. Um, it's performed by local anesthesia. Uh, there's a lot to go over, and I've put it in this slide. A person with ALS has normal lungs and normal gas exchange. What happens is that there's respiratory muscle weakness, and that leads to a chronic underinflation. Uh, under this leads to poor compliance of the alveoli and the chest wall, which is actually essentially a contracture of the chest wall. This leads to a restrictive pulmonary disease. This is your classic restrictive pulmonary disease due to neuromuscular conditions. They really won't have a lot of respiratory complaints, but they will have uh, uh, complaints of uh, having nightmares and tendency to reduce their level of physical activity because of loss of strength. Uh, nocturnal symptoms um, might be uh, frequent awakening uh, and uh, early morning headaches because of hypoxia. Uh, they'll often express that they're having excessive daytime fatigue, uh, etc. So symptoms at uh, FVC of 50%, exertional dyspnea, hypoxia, headaches, all of this stuff, it's a good reason to get uh, pulmonary function tests at baseline and then compare when they start having these uh, symptoms. A maximum expiratory pressure greater than 40 centimeters of water, 300 millimeters of mercury, is needed to generate a cough adequate for secretion clearance. Peak flow rate can be measured uh, with disposable peak flow meters. A peak flow of at least 5 liters per second or 300 liters per minute is necessary for adequate clearance of secretions. Pulmonary function should be monitored regularly, and a crude method for assessing respiratory muscle strength is to ask the patient to count as high as possible in one breath. Those with normal respiratory function can count to at least 20. The patient may also be asked to cough as hard as possible for a subjective assessment of expiratory muscle strength. A complete set of baseline pulmonary function tests, like we said in the last uh, slide, is really important, and then you can keep monitoring them to see if they're reading, reaching the point of respiratory failure. Uh, and we want to prevent aspiration and infection, assist the patient with secretion clearance. Once respiratory failure has occurred, both non-invasive and invasive respiratory support can be used to relieve symptoms and prolong life.
this figure here presents an algorithm for the prevention of acute respiratory failure and the management of chronic respiratory failure. Shortness of breath while eating can also be a sign of impending acute respiratory failure. The term motor neuron disease implies that only the motor neurons are affected. However, several studies have documented that autonomic and non-motor areas of the central nervous system eventually are affected. Uh, although dysautonomia is not generally a predominant feature of ALS, it can cause some unique clinical problems. Uh, patients may complain of feeling quite hot and active, have uh, problems of gastrointestinal motility and cardiac arrhythmia. This can cause problems when patients are exercising, particularly if they become overheated and dehydrated. Dressing in fabric that wicks away perspiration, such as polypropylene, might be helpful. Eating several small meals a day, or if a peg is being used, switching from bolus feeds to continuous drip could be recommended for those with symptomatic GI dysmotility. Ingesting plenty of fluid and taking care not to exercise to exhaustion are also recommended. Although ALS primarily causes denervation of striated skeletal muscle, it may occasionally involve the anal and urinary sphincters. Despite this incontinence, is usually not a significant clinical problem in ALS. When incontinence is a problem, it is usually due to the ability, the inability to get to the bathroom, immobility and difficulty uh, with accessing it rather than lack of sphincter control. So patients should avoid drinking large amounts of fluids after dinner to avoid nighttime incontinence. And males may want to wear a condom catheter at night. Uh, absorb it, absorbent undergarments may also be used, but the skin should be monitored closely. Um, symph symph sympathomimetic agents uh, like pseudofedrine uh, may help increase urinary uh, outlet sphincter tone. However, it also may affect blood pressure, so just be cautious of that. Indwellings, foleys, or suprapubic cats are reasonable choices later in the disease when mobility problems become so significant. Vowels are best regulated by a routine protocol on a time-based regimen. So pain um, in ALS, basically motor neuron diseases are thought to be painless disease because of the lack of sensory nerve fiber involvement. But they can frequently develop musculoskeletal pain syndrome, such as adhesive capsulitis, low back pain, and neck pain, just due to the muscle weakness and inability to change positions. A survey study of patients with SMA and slower progressing ALS, as well as other forms of neuromuscular disease, showed that the vast majority of these patients experience pain usually that is musculoskeletal. So um, fatigue uh, may be a symptom of depression, poor sleep, abnormal muscle activation, immobility, or respiratory dysfunction. Uh, it was a side effect of therapy in 26% of patients taking riluzole versus 13% taking placebo. Um, and cognitive impairment uh, really is uh, not seen in SMA. Uh, it can be seen with the frontotemporal dementia-associated ALS, um, and it may also be in later stages of the disease due to other uh, comorbidities. Um, as a group, patients with SMA don't have a significantly higher rate of depression than their normal population. However, reactive clinical depression and or anxiety is expected in ALS. Pharmacologic treatment of depression can have a positive impact on quality of life. Good family, social, and religious support systems, as well as participation in support groups, are all helpful. Once the diagnosis of ALS is confirmed, they really should be counseled with respect to prognosis. This allows time for grieving, anger, and ultimately acceptance uh, of their fate. Um, and it's a process that's important for the mental well-being of the patient and the family. Antidepressant medicine should be offered. Um, assistance with mood elevation, appetite, stimulation, and sleep, um, tricyclic antidepressants, anticholinergic uh, activity is not a good idea. Referral to a psychiatrist is probably important when um, you're seeing that clinical depression has manifested. Depression in the spouse or significant other family or friends should also not be overlooked, and group or family counseling might be helpful. Pseudobulbar affect or emotional incontinence affects about 20 to 50 percent of patients with ALS. Um, ALS patients and their families should be educated regarding this. It's a condition that's common in them and it refers to the inability to accurately portray emotions they're experiencing. Uh, they may laugh or cry when they're experiencing sadness or happiness respectively. They also may have an exaggerated response to situationally appropriate feelings. This is an upper motor neuron syndrome caused by disinhibition of the limbic control. Uh, 
despite emotional liability, the underlying mood state might be normal. Rather, it's the emotional expression of the mood that's abnormal. Although it's not a mood disorder, antidepressants are frequently employed. Numerous studies indicate that able-bodied individuals are unable to adequately judge the quality of life of those with disabilities. These studies have identified a lack of adequate communication between physician and patient and a poor perception, both positive and negative, on the part of physicians on the level of the quality of life in these patients. It takes a great deal of time to explain all the quality of life issues, including the available treatment options and choices. Without this investment of time on the clinician's part, the patient's unaware of what interventions may be uh, available to ease their suffering. The quality of life of the ventilator dependent ALS patient requires discussion because many physicians use poor quality of life as a reason to avoid discussing options concerning ventilatory support, or they present the options negatively. Although the research is limited, most ALS patients receiving ventilatory support seem to be satisfied with their choice and with their quality of life. In one series of 89 patients receiving non-invasive or invasive ventilatory support for about four years, only two patients regretted their choice of ventilation. However, only 10 of the caregivers said they would choose home ventilation for themselves if in a similar uh, situation. Motor neuron disease is a group of disorders that affects the entire family, not just the patient. The primary caregiver of the motor neuron disease is most frequently a spouse. Caregivers of patients with ALS have an increased incidence of depression and deficits in physical, mental, and social health when compared with age-matched non-caregiving controls, although perceived caregiver burden does not correlate with severity of disability. Um, family functioning predicts caregiver adjustment better than does disability level. Caregivers who comply most rigorously with rehabilitation and home care instructions experience the highest level of caregiver burden. In a study of home care services provided for 98 patients with ALS, a spouse was the primary caregiver for 73% of patients. The primary caregiver of those receiving home care services um, spent a median of 11 hours per day caring for their patient despite having some outside assistance. There's just so much to know here about uh, caregiver burden and it just means be on the lookout for your patients and their caregivers. ALS is a disease that poses unusual ethical and humanitarian considerations. Although a fatal condition, it's unlike most cancers or other grave and curable illnesses because it can take years uh, and continues to debilitate the individual. Thus, the patient with ALS has much time to think about the inevitability of the disease and what choices he wants to make in its terminal, disease, uh, terminal status. A social worker should be consulted early to help arrange durable power of attorney to a responsible family member. Living wills should be rediscussed periodically, presumably by the time of hospital, hospice level care. Uh, it's being considered the patient has had ample time for grieving, anger, and ultimately acceptance of the fate. However, many ALS patients still are hesitant about enrolling in a hospice because it implies that the disease has reached the terminal stage. They should also be referred to a support group, not only for psychological support, but also problem solving, equipment recycling of items such as hospital beds. And, you know, the patient may also not want everything that modern medicine has to offer. Life-sustaining therapy defined as any artificial device or intervention that compensates for the failure of an organ system that would normally result in death. That's the patient's choice, not the physician's. Examples include mechanical ventilation and artificial hydration and nutrition. Legally and ethically speaking, a mentally competent patient can refuse these or any other prescribed treatment. Refusal of a feeding tube, yes, will hate, hasten death, but not necessarily entail increased suffering. It's the physician's responsibility to make sure that the patient understands the consequences of his or her choices. The physician should always respect and foster the patient's autonomy and self-direction with respect to life-sustaining interventions. This does not extend to the point of physician-assisted suicide, which I did not uh, go into. In the final stages of the disease, it's medically appropriate to involve a ho home hospice team. Regular home visits um, by hospice nurses will ensure proper medication delivery, pain control, skin and bowel care, as well as providing the physician with progress reports without having to bring the patient into the clinic. They can also provide counseling to avoid panic calls to 911 by family members and unnecessary nighttime visits to the emergency room. Most patients wish to die at home. In most cases, with a supportive family and the help of a hospice, this is a feasible and worthwhile goal. An informed patient and family will become the comp will welcome the comprehensive level of terminal care that uh, a hospice offers, consoled by the knowledge that dying with dignity in the serenity and security of one's home is, in some modest but meaningful way, a measure of victory over this otherwise insufferable illness.
Physiatrists are encouraged to attend memorial services because they are a healing and rewarding experience. In the words of uh, Lou Gehrig, I might have been given a bad break, but I've got an awful lot to live for. So this is uh, basically uh, the first time I've been able to give this whole talk because it really is that long. Uh, so the last slides had not been uh, crammed in as quickly as uh, I have with the other ones. I didn't have as much practice with them, so I apologize if they were a little lengthy. Um, so uh, was this your first time thinking about uh, motor neuron diseases? If so, you know, I think it's uh, hopefully it washed over you and you got some sense of it. For the written boards, I've given you all the different uh, uh, topics that they're going to ask you. Uh, and the different diseases that they're going to ask you for the oral boards, you now have it um, organized in a way that you can think about it. Um, but as a clinician, hey, I just want you to care about these patients. Uh, when you first meet them, uh, you might be the only one actually explaining what's going on with them. Uh, electrodiagnostic testing, you know, we kind of broke down re innervation, de innervation. Um, and um, I think a great way to uh, practice for board exams is to do the AANEM SA questions. Um, for the boards, minimally learn the one disease, which is ALS, and then learn the exceptions and the differences. This is just a slide showing uh, people who I have a lot of fun with at the uh, AANEM conferences. Uh, Ileana Howard, as you can see here, uh, she is uh, actually an expert in ALS, so I recommend looking her up in uh, Seattle. And these were my references. Thank you for listening.